I have entitled our uh, series that I've been sharing, Sheep May Safely Graze. That's a beautiful piece of um, music, isn't it? You know that one? Sheep May Safely Graze. And this is a, a very um, a deep subject for me that I enjoy to meditate about, that the sheep of Jesus Christ should have a safe haven, a place where they can safely graze. Last week I shared that in our group there on the subject of uh, security in the fold. And this morning, and if, if anybody, we got, we've got the CDs here, if anybody wants this previous one, you can have it, and Sister has some um, CDs there. <clears throat> this morning, I want to spend more time on the uh, unpolluted provender, unpolluted pasture, pure doctrine that God's sheep should have. It's a very endearing sense that we receive as, as you saw these beautiful pictures even in our, in our Sabbath school this morning. Uh, the beautiful pictures of sheep with their shepherd. It's, it gives you a sense of, uh, that's a beautiful imagery there of Jesus towards his flock. Uh, this we know so well from Psalm 23. You know that psalm? We should know that one off by heart, shouldn't we? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to, to rest in, in, in safe pastures. And that, that's such an important subject. Um, Jesus himself hones in to this psalm when he speaks in John chapter 10, the Gospel of John chapter 10. And we read there from 7 verses 7 to 9, <clears throat> the Gospel of John chapter 10. We read there, from verses 7 to 9. Then just said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and shall go in and out and find pasture. Then we read verse 11. I am the good shepherd. So Jesus is not only the door of the sheepfold. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Then verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Thinking on these beautiful words, what comfort do they bring to you? They shall go in and out 
and find pasture. This metaphoric imagery that warms our hearts sadly has been tarnished in our time, if, if not already in the past. The tarnishment of this beautiful imagery is recorded in Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, <clears throat> verses 1 and 2. Where God speaks to the pastors who are supposed to be the under-shepherds. He says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my sheep. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. So this beautiful imagery has been tarnished by many of the shepherds, the under-shepherds, that have been serving professedly the God of the sheep. And the way that this is described here is enlarged in what we read during our scripture reading if we come there to Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34, and that whole chapter is describing this tarnished imagery of the beautiful shepherd caring for his flock. This is Ezekiel chapter 34, reading there from verses 1 through to 6. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel, that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat, and you clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, Neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. And they were scattered, because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill, Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. God knows something about the professed Christian churches that very few want to admit to. They all claim to be teachers of God's people. But God knows something about them. And today, in this present age in which we are living, these declarations, these tarnished pictures of God's beautiful flock uh, come to full reality. How many Christian churches have, do we have? How many independent movements do we have today? With all different contradictory doctrines and teachings. The pasture has all been spoiled. And the genuine sheep are bleating for the pure provender. Do you know that experience? Have we been in 
bewilderment like sheep today is that, you know, we're in a situation today, even in the, the shepherds of today, there's no, in the Western world, there's no real shepherds. They drive their sheep in packs. And you see the poor sheep all in a, in a, in a confused hustle and bustle and bleating and crying out, no shepherd to help them, driven by dogs. A very interesting comparison to the way it is in the Christian world in general today. And so, the true appreciation of this, what God is describing to us, is dawning upon us, and I'm sharing it with you this morning, not just to um, know what's going on as God sees it, but to try and find our way, as we were singing in this beautiful hymns. Because God does not, and Jesus, our, our wonderful shepherd, does not want to leave this situation as it is. He doesn't want to leave it this way for his true sheep. Remember what we were reading there, my sheep will recognize my voice. Are you his sheep? Can you recognize the true shepherd? This is something very, very important, to recognize the true shepherd's voice. And the true shepherd is saying in Ezekiel 34, verse 11 to 15, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. That's a comfort. He's not going to leave uh, the genuine sheep. He's not going to leave like this. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock, in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. <clears throat> and I will bring them out from among the people. Remember we read it there in the words of Jesus, other sheep that I have in other folds, there will be one fold and one shepherd. I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. And there is a, another scripture. I was, I was thrilled to find all these pictures, this imagery in the Bible of the wonderful shepherd who is going to take care of his sheep in the midst of the confusion. And here in Isaiah 40 you see it. Again, in Isaiah 40, and there we read verse 10 and 11. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work is before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. The precious imagery. This is the endearing picture that the Father in heaven wants to communicate with his sheep. 
in the light of the terrible tarnishing of the imagery when the shepherds have failed and the sheep are bleating for the pure pasture. The, the scripture we were just reading here in Isaiah 40, if we just come there to verse 9, where it says, O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountains. Remember the sheep are going to be fed in the high mountain? The true church is to be in the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God, behold him, look at him, see what he is like. This is the true fold, the true shepherds that, will, that Jesus was talking about, that he is going to feed them in the mountains with pure pasture, the fold there. And this particular if you read the, and study Isaiah chapter 40 thoroughly, and you can see it already suggested in that verse 9, that there is a, 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 a company of people, of ministers, that will feed their flock correctly. It's the, it's the Zion, God's true Zion that will bring good tidings. It's a voice, verse 6. The voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is the flower of the grass, etc. A voice, the church, giving its message. There is a prophecy for these last days that is actually describing such an event that is right upon us. It's Revelation chapter 18. We know Revelation 14, the three angels' messages. In Revelation 18, there is another angel that repeats the messages of the three. And after that angel, and we recall, if you've studied carefully, what do the angels represent? They are the ministers the faithful ministers giving the messages. And because the three angels' messages have been prolonged and the false shepherds have muddied the waters, confused the sheep, God brings another angel, Revelation 18. And after Revelation 18, verse 1 to 3, there is another voice. Many people miss that understanding Let's read it there because this is what we were reading in Isaiah 40. The voice, the, the, the message that is giving the last call for God's sheep to come together. Revelation 18 verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Is that not the shepherd calling? the sheep out of those folds that are, have been so polluted and so confused with false doctrine? And how relevant is that not also for Adventism today? He has to call a people, the sheep, out of the folds that have been polluting the pasture. So let's think very carefully. He will feed his flock with fat pasture. That's the language that was given there in Ezekiel 34 that we were reading there in verse 18. Let's go there, Ezekiel 34, verse 18. We didn't read that one. Go back to Ezekiel, chapter 34, verse 18 and 19. Seemeth it a small thing unto you that you have eaten up the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures. So there are people who have been feeding on the pasture of God's word, but as they do so, they 
muddy it. They tramp it under feet. And that have drunk of the deep waters, but you must foul the residue with your feet. And as for my flock, they eat that which you have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. What a description of spiritual food that has been trampled about and confused for the, for the taste buds of these sheep. It doesn't taste very nice. It's yuck. It's confusing. People are not happy here. Verse 31 actually punchlines this fact here when it says in verse 31, You and you, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. He just brings the point home. This imagery has to do with you human beings. So, pasture. You will, he will feed us in the pure pasture. He will take us away from the trodden pastures, from the fouled up, polluted waters that the sheep had, had, had to drink. What is pure <coughs> What is pure pasture? What is that? What is untrodden pasture? What is unpolluted water? What is it? Let's go over to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, reading here verse 28. Jeremiah chapter 23. <clears throat> Remember Isaiah, Jeremiah comes that after Isaiah. Jeremiah 23. We read there verse 28. And I just want to read the second line there. He that hath my word, he that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? So what is pasture? What is the nourishment of the sheep? It is, as it says there, the word of God that is spoken faithfully. If it's not spoken faithfully, it's chaff. If it is spoken faithfully and it is pure pasture, that is the wheat. So what is the chaff to the wheat? So we get the picture here that the pure provender, the pure pasture is the doctrine of the, of the Lord, the pure doctrine. And today we have chaff instead of wheat. Let Sister White enlarge it for us in This Day with God, page 296. In paragraph 4 it says, We have an abundance of weighty, solemn truths to proclaim from the Word of God without allowing the mind to devise and plan theories of human nothingness to present to the flock of God as testing truth. Are you hearing that today? Human nothingness is being fed. How many sheep in the churches today are going home hungry because it's been human nothingness, chaff. And that's exactly what she said. They are giving that to the flock of God as testing truth. And then she says, she quotes that scripture, what is the chaff to the wheat? So the call of God to his church, to his Zion, is I want you to present pure doctrine. Doctrine that is from me, not from man. 
And this, for our time, has been clearly enunciated and identified by the testimony of Jesus. What has the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, identified as the pure doctrine in, in, a, in a nutshell? And to, read, to get this, I will read Great Controversy from page 423, where it says, in paragraph 1, The subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. Now, our mind is taken right back to the beginning of Adventism. It opened to view a complete system of truth, connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty as it brought to light the position and work of his people. Doesn't that ring beautifully in harmony with what we have been reading about the Lord looking after his flock? Back there in 1844, you had all the bifurcations of all the different denominations, and they all had different doctrines amongst themselves, uh, contradicting each other, and there was the raising of Zion. And they were given that beautiful subject of the sanctuary doctrine that is a sanctuary in heaven and all connected with it. And what did that unlock? The disappointment? It opened to view. What did it open to view? A complete system of truth. Not only did it open up a complete system of truth, beautiful pasture, beautiful doctrine in all its systemic unfolding, it says showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty as it brought to light not only the pure doctrines but the position where God's church is. That's what I read there, didn't I? That it showed the position and work of his people. So if I and you, as followers of Jesus, want to find the pure pasture and the pure fold, we've got to come to the understanding of that which we have just read there in Great Controversy. That's what we need to come to. Then we will know we are in, the, in Zion among the mountains, which we were reading there. I read from, as I mentioned here, here we have in the enunciation of the pure doctrine. In Councils to Writers and Editors, page 52, page 53, sorry, in paragraph 2 and 3, you have another testimony of Jesus that puts it in a beautiful nutshell that you can be assured that here is the pure provender. Here is the pure wheat, not chaff. It says, in the future, she wrote that back in 1905. From 1905, she says, looking into the future, she says what? In the future, deception of every kind is to arise. The, mud, the water will be muddy. The pasture will be trodden underfoot. Deception of every kind is to arise. And we want, we want solid ground for our feet. We want solid pillars for the building. Not one pin is to be removed from that which the Lord has established. The shepherd has established it. Not a pin is to be removed.
the enemy will bring in false theories such as what is one of the false one of the false theories such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary there is no sanctuary in heaven it's just one big place that's a, one of the doctrines that has brought the Seventh day Adventist people into a bleating sheep mass. We don't know anymore what the facts are. This is one of them. Now, notice what, how, how, it, how clearly the, the statement goes on to help us. This is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. One of the points. Where, now comes the beautiful help, the pure pasture, where shall we find safety? Where shall we find safe pasture? Unless it be in the truths that the Lord has been giving for the last 50 years. You know, when I was, I was thrown into chaos at the age of uh, 15, 16, 17 through to 21, 22. I did my nurse's training in the Sydney Adventist Hospital. I relied on the institution and I discovered very quickly I was choking on the, on the chair. And I thought, where are you, Lord? And he had to help me. I'm standing here today at the age of 68 praising God for helping me through the darkness. And that's why I have had an experience behind me. From the age of 21, 22, the Lord showed me the security of Sister White's writings of the early pioneer years. Because when, he t when I was thrown into this confusion, I came across this statement and said, where can I find safety? Oh, here it is. Over the past 50 years, all the doctrines that were established in the ranks of Seventh-day Adventism. So I made it my duty to examine all that was taught by them as an organization, not as individuals, but as a united voice. And I found my pasture. And it's been my joy over the years to be a shepherd of the flock, to feed the flock with that pure pasture. Not my own opinion. Surrender my own opinion to that which has been identified as the pure pasture. This is my responsibility as a servant of God. But I have also watched over those years, this was in the 1970s, I watched over those years the splintering and the splintering and more splintering of Seventh-day Adventism into such a position where I watched them all claiming if they've come out of false doctrine, now we've got the pure doctrine. But they haven't got the pure doctrine because some of them teach that, there is, that God is, not, is only one person. <laughs> that, that's one particular company. They really put it forth to you as though this is truth. There's only one God, and Jesus is not God. He's the Son of God. And there's no Holy Spirit as a third person. They teach that very strongly. Then there's all the other things that have come up which have been one pin or another removed from that which has been once held over those 50 years. One pin, even just a pin, has been removed by certain of these independent movements. So... We want, in this atmosphere of, of truth that has been contorted, we want pure doctrine, we want to have security in the fold, we want to defend the pure doctrine. But what is our peril at this time of trying to restore pure doctrine. And I want you to follow me very carefully now because I don't want you to come away from this message 
that I would be suggesting to you that pure doctrine is not important. It is absolutely important. But follow me carefully what our danger is. While we are in this atmosphere of having to defend pure doctrine. Is there danger for us? Let's go to Jude, first of all, to emphasize that it is our duty to defend the pure doctrine. And I take this very seriously in my own ministry because one day I have to give an answer for what I've done as a, as a servant of God. Let's come to Jude 3. Jude 1 verse 3 where the apostle says here, Jude 1, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And that applies very much to earnestly contending for that which the Lord gave back there in 1844 over those 50 years. We should earnestly contend. And you pick up these words and you say, right, I'm going to fight for this. In today's religious atmosphere, among the multiple ministries all claiming to teach truth, yet differing with one another, what can you see? All claiming to defend the truth. What can you see? Debate? Confining our religious experience by apologetics, theological argumentation, defense, against what they claim to be error. And we, if we stand, if we stand 100% on the pure Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, what is our danger? What am I going to get embroiled into? What's our danger? Follow carefully. Did Jesus enter into debate? Did Jesus pride himself that he had the truth and the others were all wrong? Is this Jesus? We are right. And I'm ever occupied in defending what I know to be right. And I'm so occupied doing it that I'm missing out what I should be growing up into through the doctrine. Is it enough to have pure doctrine? Is it enough? I'm glad you're shaking your head. What is our danger, even though we may have pure doctrine? What's our danger? I want to read it from the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus. It's here from the book Evangelism, page 290, paragraph 1. It says, Firmly may certain doctrines of truth be held. Firmly. Again and again they may be reiterated till the holders come to think that they are indeed in possession of the great blessings which these doctrines represent. But the greatest, most powerful truths may be held and yet kept in the outer court exerting little influence to make the daily life wholesome and fragrant. 
The soul is not sanctified through the truth that is not practiced. Now, I wish you could have come, could come with me through my past experience. I've been through this. My own father was, was vehemently defending the truth. But as he was vehemently defending the truth, he wasn't representing Jesus at all. I remember one night, I was 10 years of age, I was lying in the room not far from the lounge room where my father was meeting with the Christadelphian. And they were hammer and tongs. And my father was screaming and so was he. Because my father was defending pure truth. And I heard what he was saying. He was, he was defending pure truth. But I thought, Ugh, this makes me sick. Is this, and I have watched over the years, there are so many now. I remember while I was doing my nurse's training in the Seventh-day Adventist institution there in Sydney, and at the same time at Avondale College, there was Des Ford and the older ministers arguing the point, and I, there was an, the Jacaranda, that was the paper that they put out at that time, among the young people. Will the real Jesus please stand up? I read that article. Will the real Jesus please stand up? Because the young people were like sheep. <laughs> where's, where's the real Jesus? The older ministers were saying this. Des Ford was saying that. And this atmosphere has continued to our time. Pure doctrine, if we are going to defend the pure doctrine, are we in danger of confusing the sheep by the manner in which we communicate it? That's possible. It's a terrible, serious problem. I read another very relevant statement from the testimony of Jesus in Christ Triumphant. Christ Triumphant, page 331. That's the, uh, another one of those beautiful morning watch readings. Just taken from Sister White in, in page 331, paragraph 5 and 6. <clears throat> the correct interpretation of the scripture is not all that God requires. Did you hear that? The correct interpretation of the scripture is not all that God requires. He enjoins upon us that we should not only know the truth, but that we should practice the truth as it is in Jesus. We are to bring into our practice, in our association with others, the spirit of him who gave us the truth. Did you pick that up? Not only to hold the truth, but the spirit of the truth. This is, brings the, the, the responsibility very strongly home to us. It goes on to say, um, we, must not only, we must not only search for the truth as for hidden treasure, but it is a positive necessity if you are if you are laborers together with God that we comply with the conditions laid down in the word and bring the spirit of Christ into our hearts that our understanding may be strengthened and we become apt teachers to make known to others the truth revealed to us in his word so we may reiterate the pure doctrine, we may go over it and over, and we think, yes, this is it, I know this to be right, but my life is not fragrant by that spirit of that doctrine. Sister White writes in Testimony, Volume 5, page 540, in paragraph 1, she says this one sentence, there will be some terrible falls by those who think they stand firm because they have the truth, but they have it not. 
as it is in Jesus. This is serious. I'm defending truth. But I don't have it as it is in Jesus. I don't have the right spirit behind what I'm teaching. And I'm still going to fall. But I thought I was going to be secure. That is the message to Laodicea. You, are, you say you are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. And Sister White makes a very interesting statement here in regards to this. And I want to just quickly read that. Testimony, Volume 5, page 682, paragraph 1, where it says, a very, very important little sentence here. Here it is. He may observe the forms of religion and zealously maintain its doctrines. He may do that. Zealously maintain. While destitute of its spirit. That's serious. And that's what she says. His condition, his condition is that described by the true witness. Thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So he's defending the truth. He is really upholding it all on the platform of truth as it's been enunciated. But the Laodicean condition can be there. And he doesn't even know that he is wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Once we have the pure doctrine, once we've established that I know this to be absolutely pure doctrine, what is meant to take place thereafter? What is to follow? What is the doctrine designed to achieve? You see, many people keep on... Satan is very happy to keep them debating over what's pure doctrine and what isn't. If he can keep them on that level, he's happy. Because the pure doctrine will never prepare us to meet God's character. Because God, the pure doctrine must be held according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 18. Romans chapter 1, reading there from verses 16 to 18. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, what is the gospel of Christ? What's the doctrine of Christ? It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there in page 190, paragraph 1, she says, the sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth. Now follow carefully. It's the one great truth around which all other truths cluster in order to be rightly understood, did you catch that? Rightly understood and appreciated. Every truth in the word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. I present before you the great grand monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption, the Son of God, uplifted on the cross. This is to be the foundation of every discourse given by our ministers. The foundation of every discourse. And as I preach this, I get into trouble. Because the atonement of Jesus is Jesus at one with us, suffering with my sin suffering with my temptations. And if I want to overcome my temptations and my sins, I must have the example of Jesus how to do it. 
This is one doctrine that is so contorted in the mind of the people today. In fact, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, if you were to go into it, they deny this doctrine too. Some. Especially the, from the 1888 onwards. Yeah, it depends who you're talking to, but, but the leadership in general. So, in their publications, they tell you differently. But the early ones, they tell you the truth. So, we are to hold this truth that Jesus may truly be our example and we can have the character of Jesus. Looking at Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. I'm just about finished now, but let's follow this important ingredient by which the truth that will is the great central truth around which all other truths cluster needs to be appreciated so that we can then defend the truth as, as it is in Jesus. Because when we are opposed by those who don't believe as I do, we are in danger of letting self come forth. Romans 8, 1 to 3. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. How? For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in what? In the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Many people say the likeness of sinful flesh wasn't the real thing. It was just like it. And that's what the ministers of the reform are telling me. I say, I'm sorry, I read it as it says. The likeness of sinful flesh is of such a nature that he could condemn the sin in his flesh. That's the way it reads, doesn't it? So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And as we fight for the pure doctrine, we must keep self completely condemned together with Jesus. And when we do that, we will fight correctly for the truth. So when this doctrine is held in its connection with all the other doctrines, we will have the latter reign. We will, have, we will be equipped to give the loud cry. And what is the loud cry like? What is it in reality? Let's read it in conclusion. This is the description of the latter rain that comes as a result of the pure doctrine. It's in Testimony, Volume 6, page 400, paragraph 3. She describes the picture perfectly here. Trials thicken around us. Both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. Can't we see it? Some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare will in time of real peril make it manifest that they have not built upon the solid rock. They will yield to temptation. <coughs> warfare, argument, conflict. That's what she's talking about. And then it goes on to say, um, those who have had great light and precious privileges but have not improved them, will under one pretext or another go out from us. Not having received the love of the truth, they will be taken in the delusions of the enemy. They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and will depart from the faith. But on the other hand, when the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, now comes the sheep, the true sheep, will hear the true shepherd's voice. Self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost, and many who have strayed from the fold will come back to follow the great shepherd. The people of God will draw together and present to the enemy a united front. 
in view of the common peril, strife for the supremacy will cease. There will be no disputing as to who shall be accounted greatest. No one of the true believers will say, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas. The testimony of one and all will be, I cleave unto Christ, I rejoice in him as my personal saviour. Thus will the truth be brought into practical life. And thus will be answered the prayer of Christ, uttered just before his humiliation and death, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now follow carefully. The love of Christ, the love of our brethren, will testify to the world that we have been with Jesus and learned of him. Then will the message of the third angel swell to a loud cry. And the whole earth will be lightened with the glory of God. How will that happen? When God's people are in unity and the love of Jesus is operating among them. That is the, as a result of the outpouring of the latter rain and that will be such a loud cry that, as they say, your actions will speak louder than your words. So my sheep may safely graze as we take hold of this scenario that I have tried to share. There's much more to it, but we thank God that he is taking the work into his hands. If we are his sheep, we will recognise that voice. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.